first of all. Something you already know about, but I decided to say a few words about this, about the silence. Um, why keeping silence? Well, first of all, there's another group who keeps silence, so we better keep quiet. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> That's not the main reason. But uh, basically, in this situation, in this uh, retreat setting, what is as a basis to make this most effective is to keep what are called the ten virtues. Now, since it's pretty easy to refrain from killing, stealing, and sexual misconduct in this setting in particular, so don't need to make a rule. Um, there are no mosquitoes at this time of the year, so no one is tempted to squash a mosquito. Um, and then, in terms of killing anyway, not a problem, stealing not a problem. Um, and no sexual misconduct. So then the danger arises with the four non virtues of the speech lie, harsh speech, lying, divisive speech, and, devi and uh, senseless gossip. Now, okay, we could spend the time and try to watch all four and make sure we don't break any, but if we don't talk, we don't break any. So it's the safest, right? And instead of uh, engaging in any of the non virtues to keep the mind on the teachings, to keep mindful when you walk from one place to the other, when you're in your room, just what's happening in the mind, just watch. And as you'll find out, uh, well, with the teachings, with this particular topic here, meditation is extremely important. It's not difficult to understand uh, the six perfections, the four, first four perfections. There's nothing difficult about them, it's difficult to do it. So therefore, um, to keep mindful and if for some reason you need to communicate, to have those four always in the back of your mind. Not to engage in harsh speech, not to lie, not to engage in divisive speech and senseless gossip. Okay. All right. So this is just to create a good foundation and also when the mind is mindful, introspective, if it's attentive, then to not break the three non-virtues of the mind either, because that's of course most important to not have any uh, ill will or in other words harmful kind of intent, not to have any uh, attachment or have no, what's the other word, uh, covetousness as like wanting things, like being overwhelmed by attachment and of course not having any wrong views. Okay. So it's easy, I will keep the other seven to then focus very mindfully on the last three. So this is an, an, a good opportunity to do so, so to keep the silence. And you're gonna be my guinea pigs, because I'll try something new with this course. As I was preparing, as I was making my notes, because it's a lot of material, I decided it may be most beneficial if I teach for some time on a particular part and we meditate for some time. And I teach, and we meditate. And I teach, and we meditate. So instead of having just one analytical meditation, I'll speak about a few things, and then I'm, we sit down for about 10 minutes, reflect upon what we've discussed. So it really goes deeper, and it's not just intellectual information that goes in here, and of course, it goes out there again because there's so much, so overwhelming. So let's try that and see how you like it. <coughs> if you don't like it, next course we won't do it. <laughs> or if already before that you start protesting, then I'll stop. <laughs> but um, anyway, I thought this was maybe more effective, so we won't really have any meditation session uh, as planned for tomorrow evening, meditation 7.15 to 18. We just continue with this, okay? All right. And. Um, I don't know exactly about the timing, like it's not gonna be like half an hour exactly on the spot because I also have to finish a certain part of it. But um, let's see how it goes. I, I'm thinking maybe half an hour of speaking and then 10 minutes just thinking about it. So I'll guide you through it, go through some of the points again, but to really allow it to sink deeper and allow you time for some analysis, kind of more focused, more intensive analysis. And then also, and I'll speak about this, we'll start with a minute of breathing, just to calm the mind. 
then there'll be some analysis. And then lastly, what is so important is whatever kind of feeling arises after you've meditated, there is some feeling like a, maybe some kind of determination, some sense of, yes, I should do this. Yeah, that makes sense. Or maybe even something else like, I don't know, whatever the feeling is, but to concentrate on that feeling and allow this to sink in. You just focus on that mind and make it like soak deeper if you like you might if some people describe it as like your mind gets soaked by the feeling or it just sinks deeper to a more <coughs> innate kind of level if you like all right so let's start a lot of perfections to cover and it is very extensive especially patience and generosity are very extensive so let's uh, start okay so I basically my notes basically on the Namrim, it's the most extensive. And if we get time, I'll also mention uh, the Abhisami Amanka, no, sorry, uh, the Supplement to the Middle Way, uh, Chandrakirti's commentary on the fundamental wisdom, which also deals with, well, the first four chapters deal for each chapter with one of the, the um, Paramitas. So this would be a good time uh, to mention them, but just depending on the time. So first of all, the first six, I don't, really, I don't even want to call them perfections. They're called, actually in Sanskrit, I prefer the word paramitas to paramita, because perfection, oh, I think in the 21st century anyway, we're totally obsessed about being perfect and, and it gives so much pressure already. And um, it depends on how you look at perfection, but I think if you say perfection of generosity, it seems to imply that everyone is free from, you've been able to give to everyone, you've perfected generosity in the sense that now there's no one left to suffer, which of course is not true. Um, so even the Buddha is still limited because the Buddha is not omnipotent. So therefore perfection, I mean, from a living being's point of view, of course, it doesn't get any greater. So the generosity of a Buddha, that's the best any living being can achieve. So from that point of view, the word perfection is used but I prefer to say, say paramita. Um, and so paramita has different meanings. Well, parama in Sanskrit means the highest, highest or the chief, primary, most excellent. So therefore it can be here rendered to mean excellence or perfection if you like, I mean excellence or superior. Um, and then another way of looking at it, or another way of the to speak of the etymology of the meaning of the word paramita, is to divide para and mita, those two syllables, with para means beyond, and mita means, uh, mita kind of means that which has arrived. So para means beyond or the other shore, the other side or the other uh, further bank or shore. And then uh, mita kind of means uh, mita means that which has arrived. So that is similar to the Tibetan translation, Parodhuchimba, or Pajin. Pajin is the short version of Parodhuchimba. Paru means kind of over there, the other side. Chimba means, Chimba means having gone, having arrived, or having went, right? So having gone to the other side. So it's kind of like a transcendental uh, um, state, if you like, but transcendental just means going beyond the from the egocentric state to the non-egocentric state. In other words, going beyond the ordinary, driven by our self-grasping or by, by even the imprints of the self-grasping, going beyond to a non-egocentric, to a non-self-centered state. So that would be uh, the paramita, so having gone beyond, having arrived beyond. Okay. All right, so then, Therefore, these six parameters are mainly concerned with overcoming self, the misperception and the self-centered attitude which arises from the misperception. Okay. So in, the, in, the, in Mahayana Buddhism, it's the Prashna Paramita Sutras, uh, the Lotus Sutra, and many other texts, um, they list the, 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 the six perfections uh, in their original terms like Dana is the word for generosity, sila, which also means, um, which 
in Sidan's kind of like coolness or ethical conduct or ethics. Shanti is uh, patience. Vidya is, uh, well, effort, joyous effort or um, diligence, perseverance. Dhyana is the one point of concentration and Prashna is wisdom. So these are just the Sanskrit words. And the order of those six perfections, of course, is seen as extremely important because the first one is the basis for the next one is the basis for the next one. So each of those perfections, they get harder and harder to do. And the previous ones, so generosity, makes it easier to practice uh, ethical conduct, makes it easier to practice patience, and so forth. And of course, lastly, there's wisdom. But with each practice, Actually, if the practice is done properly with generosity, you also have the other ones. So when you practice generosity, you also have the practice of ethical conduct or ethical discipline. You also have patience. You also have uh, joyous effort or diligence. You have concentration. You have wisdom. And we'll speak about them. They're mentioned with each parameter. And so I'll go through the first four. And with each parameter, it will be described why the other five are also present. So I will speak about this. But anyhow, there is this kind of progression here, um, which also explains why a bodhisattva who has reached the first bhumi, which is uh, uh, simultaneous or which happens when you reach the path of seeing, at that time, you focus on the first bhumi, on the parameter of giving. On the second bhumi, on the parameter of ethical conduct or ethical discipline. The third parameter is patience. The fourth is joyous effort and so forth. And you speak of not just six perfections, but also ten. So then all the bhumis are associated with one of the perfections. Okay. So Now, basically, um, the idea is with regard to the six perfections. Well... There are different levels. There are, so, there are different levels of the, the six perfections in the sense of um, depends on the motivation we have. So with regard to one's motivation, uh, the giving one can practice giving, one can practice, for example, generosity in order to attain happiness in this lifetime. It's not usually mentioned, but I think it can be mentioned. I don't think it's there's any fault in I mean, oftentimes they don't mention uh, a Buddhist goal, they don't mention the goal of happiness in this lifetime, because people automatically, in order to attain happiness in this lifetime, accumulate non-virtue. They're more likely to accumulate non-virtue in order to gain happiness in this lifetime. So right from the beginning, it is not seen as one of the goals, it's not seen as one of the destinations. Because the moment you look at future lifetimes, there's no way that any negativity could lead to future happiness because we can't take anything with us except the karmic seeds. So it makes sense that by focusing right away, initially, at future lifetimes, that our actions become much purer. But that is only possible if we have some conviction in, in future lives and also if we have a sense of renunciation, not being so concerned with the happiness of this lifetime. But I think there's no problem in including also generosity, for example, in order to feel good. Like right away when we're generous, when we practice unconditioned generosity, I should say, without any expectation to get back any worldly kind of reward such as fame or getting something back in return, getting a good reputation, etc. If it's just for the sake of being generous, without expecting anything back, then right away there's a sense of peace, uh, we feel happier, it feels right. So that could be one motivation. But then of course one can take it further to give with a motivation to what? Experience future happiness, to be reborn in a state that offers many different opportunities, different <coughs> freedoms, and, uh, etc. And to experience also happiness in those states. So usually, actually, generosity is not associated with positive rebirth. It is ethical conduct that is responsible mainly for a rebirth in higher states. 
And then in order to have certain opportunities, it is generosity that provides those. But even generosity in itself, it does provide or does serve as one of the conditions for higher rebirth. And then of course, one can also uh, practice generosity in order to overcome the three types of suffering and to become liberated. And the highest goal would be to practice generosity for the benefit of all sentient beings so that we may be able to benefit others in the most effective way. And for that, we want to become enlightened. So of course, here, this being the Mahayana goal, that our goal would be to generate Mahayana, the Mahayana, have the Mahayana motivation conjoined with generosity. Does anyone know, does anyone not know what it means to have bodhicitta conjoined with generosity? Is there anyone who doesn't know what that means? Generosity, and we'll come to this in a moment, it needs to be explained, but generosity is mainly a mental state. Right? It is a mind that gives, a mind that wants to give. So we do not say that it's only mental because, of course, the giving, the physical giving, verbal giving, as in like verbally giving um, consolation, verbally uh, helping someone, that's also a type of generosity. We spend our time, give people advice, um, protect them from fear, etc. Um, or physically, of course, giving something. So that is also generosity, but only if it's motivated by a mental state of wanting to give. So the mental state of wanting to give should be there as a motivation, and it should be there at the time of the action. Now, if that mind, that mind that wants to give, that mind that wants to give, if that is conjoined with bodhicitta, what does that mean? What does it mean if it's conjoined with bodhicitta? Does it mean that when we give, so it's one type of awareness. The giving mind is a type of awareness which wants to give, right? I mean, I think the most effortless example of giving is when we give to ourselves. <laughs> a good example of generosity, the purest kind of generosity that we have right now, when we just want to give to ourselves. So really that feeling of wanting to give to ourselves, the only difference is if we want to give to others. With that same kind of spontaneity, with that same kind of effortlessly, effortlessness, so instead of wanting to give to oneself, now wanting to give to others. Okay? So that's the kind of generosity here. So if you want to get a feeling for what is that wish to give, well, we have it all the time when you want to give something to yourself. Spontaneous, effortlessly, joyously. Now, except you don't give it to yourself, you give it to another person. Or if you have children, you know, if you give something to your children, that joyous, effortless, spontaneous ability to give. Okay, that's the kind of feeling. Except the person now, who you give it to, that is a little more difficult. But when I say it is conjoined with bodhicitta, what do I actually mean? Does bodhicitta have to be present in that moment? Do you have to, while you win, so you should, before you give, you should have the wish to give, and while you're giving, you should have the wish to give, okay? Um, it may not always be present, but there should be at some point in time while you're giving, giving also be that thought to give. All right, so what about bodhicitta? Does it have to be present? Shaha says no. So what's your suggestion? It should be, it should be prior, prior to the action, it must be there. Okay. Okay, so where would it be then if the, so first you generate bodhicitta, okay, so before to have the thought, may I become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings, okay, so then after that, the mind to wants to give arises, and it is conjoined with bodhicitta. What does that mean? Even though bodhicitta is no longer there, it is still conjoined. What does it mean? But what does it mean to be conjoined with something? What is, where is bodhicitta in that moment when the other one uh, arises, when the wish to give arises? Where is bodhicitta? Mm. Is it manifestly there? No, it's in the back no. of the mind. 
It's in the back of our mind. What's another word of expressing that? It lies dormant. It lies latent. But even though it lies dormant, it's in the back of our mind, or it lies dormant, it's not manifestly there. In other words, we don't wish to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. That mind is not there. We don't have that wish in that moment. But it lies dormant, which means any time we want it to arise again, it can arise. So it lies latent or dormant in that moment. But why is it conjoined with the generosity? What makes it conjoined? Could you think about the an idea that when you give something, you do think maybe you might think of <coughs> maybe helping you for the for the welfare of all sentient beings, which is the chitta in a way. Mm -hmm. What what is in the light about not helping others? So okay, to conjoin actually means something very specific mm -hmm. that it gets influenced by bodhicitta. It can to be conjoined means that bodhicitta makes the mind that wants to give stronger. And the mind that wants to give, wants to give, makes bodhicitta stronger. They enhance one another. Does that make sense? It influences the mind that wants to give. It influences it. So the best example I can come up with uh, for a mind that influences another mind, even though it's not present. I've mentioned this mind before. I said that I gave this example, like when you are very, very sad, and even your sense consciousnesses are influenced by the sadness such that the sky doesn't seem as blue, doesn't seem as bright. Food doesn't taste as good as usually it would. That means you're influenced by the sadness. Your mind is just a little dampened. Okay? So, like, or if you're in love, if you're in love with someone, newly in love, you know there's this fresh feeling, it's very strong, then any food tastes better. Any thought you have, brighter and clearer. Now here, bodhicitta is like being in love, except you have love for all sentient beings. So that type of awareness is such that it brightens your wish to give. It's strengthening. It makes it, it gives it some extra force. So even though bodhicitta is no, like first you have the thought, may I become a knight for the benefit of all sentient beings. Then that thought goes away and a new one comes. I want to give, I want to give now to this person. And it's like underneath the underlying kind of wish is all sentient beings. So it, it's not really manifestly there, but it's still influencing you. That means your true awarenesses, the mind that wants to give, generosity, and bodhicitta are conjoined. Right? Yes. If, if we live in kind of taking from the bodhicitta, yeah. how we think of giving for all sentient beings, yeah. in each each act of giving. Uh -huh. And if I want to connect it to the bodhicitta, yeah. I could give the, uh, the merit from the giving to the... Oh, that's what you... That's about the object you give. Yes, that's true. To all the sentient beings. And then I mm -hmm. connect the giving mm -hmm. and the bodhicitta together. Yes, yes. But what I meant was like when you have the wish to give, there's no wish to become enlightened for the benefit of sentient beings in that moment, right? They could, it could be alternating very quickly, right? For the benefit of all sentient beings, the wish to give. But you don't do it simultaneously. It's not possible. I don't think it's possible that you have both really, to wish to give and to the wish to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. You, you do it alternately. But one influences the other. So the stronger your bodhicitta, the stronger the wish to give. The stronger the wish to give, the stronger your bodhicitta. Does that make sense? I'm not contradicting what you're saying. That's absolutely right, what you said. But the conjoining, this idea of conjoining, it comes up all the time. This word conjoining. You have one mind conjoined with another. It doesn't mean you have to have both simultaneously. Another example is wisdom and bodhicitta. Right? Okay. So here we're aiming for generosity that is conjoined with bodhicitta. That should be the driving force. Okay. All right. And only when those, any of these, so the ones I've said before, so the wish to have happiness in this lifetime, conjoined with giving, okay. or the wish to have future, happy future lifetimes, that wish conjoined with giving, or the wish to be liberated conjoined with giving. So again, these motivations are again in the same way conjoined. One grows stronger because of the other. Right? But so the moment any of those conjoined with a particular wish, with a particular 
motivation. When this arises spontaneously and effortlessly, you have basically achieved that type of generosity. So in the case of the, uh, the, the last type, well, that would be the parameter of generosity when it's, it's totally effortless and spontaneous. So this is actually only when you're good at it. It's totally effortless, totally spontaneous. Uh, the, this state of spontane spontaneity, there are different degrees, of course, it becomes more and more spontaneous, more and more effortless. So sometimes we call something spontaneous relative to the state before. Before there was so much effort, it took so much time. So in, in comparison to the earlier state, it's spontaneous. But it becomes more and more spontaneous and less and less effort is required. And the least effort or the total absence of effort and the absolute spontaneity is reached when you're a product. Okay? Does that make sense? So just the difference between those different motivations. Um, so, of course, the motivation we do not want to have at all times, at any time, is to have fame, or be praised, have any kind of worldly reward, except for, you know, just feeling good about, that's okay. But to, to reach any, any of the, well, eight worldly concerns, well, the, the first four, any kind of uh, pleasure, other than just feeling good about the action, but any kind of other kind of pleasant experience, uh, praise, gain, or good reputation, all right? So, and then with this in mind, while well, talking about generosity, well, we can check, we may wonder, I mean, this is a good example, we may wonder, am I generous or not, right? So I want you, and this is will be once we start meditating, very important anyway, to really ask yourself, am I generous? Now, we are, it depends, I mean, we're very generous with certain things. I'm very generous with my garbage. You know, bag of garbage. Oh, <laughs> please, have it. Very generous. So it depends on the object, right? So objects that I am not very attached to, easy. Garbage, very easy, super easy. Uh, things that I'm attached to, very difficult. So it depends on the object. But a good way to check is, am I happy to pay my bills? Because actually, if you get a bill and there's a sense of, mm, I mean, you've actually gotten something for it. You get a bill, you have to pay, but it's not even generosity. It's you're paying for something that you have received something for. So I think a good example to check how generous we are is when we get a bill. Because if we practice generosity <coughs> motivated by the Mahayana motivation, it should be wanting to give to anyone. Right? And if then a bill arrives because of the electricity we have spent or the water we have used, I don't know whether you have to pay for water, but there you go. <laughs> so, well, for the telephone that, you know, we've used, etc. And these bills arrive, it is a sense like, mm, oh, it's a good sign. Whoa. You know, it shows there's some type of miserliness, stinginess. Actually, it's worthy. I have to pay the bills anyway, so I might as well. Exactly. Get a motivation of, like, let's pay for us and we exactly. don't need the charity. Wonderful so opportunity. Well <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the, I'm saying the way to test yourself is your feeling when a, when, a, when a bill arrives? How do you feel? Just a first test. I'm just saying we need to check how generous are we, right? How generous are we? How can we become, first to see how, what our limits are. Because what is very important is never to give without wanting to give. Don't give if you don't want to give. So initially, when we talk about generosity, it seems impossible. It seems like, if you hear some of the generous actions, well, we don't need to do this right now. No one forces us to do it. To see this as a goal, as something worthwhile, and then to check, how generous am I? So, we talk about the person giving, that is us. So what keeps us from giving? Number one, what is, which recipient do we like to give, and which recipient do we not like to give? And what is it that we 